Welcome to the We Are All Dying podcast. I'm your host, Jenna Goodhand, and my hope is that through these conversations, we become more comfortable, competent, and confident talking about death. On today's show, we have Shannon Scott, the remarkable storyteller from Savannah, Georgia, and we are talking all things cemeteries. We'll just jump right in then. Thank you so much for offering me this time and a chance to chat, Shannon. Well, my complete pleasure. So th uh, the honor is mine. I have so many questions. Um, so I'm just wondering where to begin. I guess we could begin at the beginning. So <laughs> if you're if you're comfortable, I'd love to ask you personally, like, you know, your own journey with death in your life when you remember death kind of showing up for the first time at your door and what that experience was like for you. And then we can kind of see where it ended up. Certainly. Um, well, my, my grandmother on my mother's side was Agnes Reem Scott, and she was, um, a Kentucky woman and I never knew my mother's father. He died a year before I was born, but I learned a lot about him through my mother. And I feel like that was an early gestation of the notion or concept of death was my mother bringing her father an educator to life for me. And he was, believe it or not, he was born in 1889. Um, isn't that amazing? Yeah. Uh, she had, my, my mother had a 19th century father. Wow. Um, but nonetheless, I really have always felt a living connection to him. And, you know, and he blessed me financially even after, you know, in my life. Um, so, I mean, it, it's amazing how, you know, your ancestor goes by the way, but somehow they bless you with like a dowry or, you know, just, just the, you know, your own mother, of course, is a product of your, your grandparent. Um, so it's like they're living through them, you know, and, and then in you, but my grandmother Coco, as we called her, K.O. K.O. That was the family nickname because when I was a child, there was a, um, probably not very politically correct book called Little Brown Coco. But I love this childhood story. And it was, a, it was a 1920s book. And when I would see my grandmother, because she would read that book to me, I would, I would run up to her and cry, Coco, Coco. So this is how her nickname was born. And she taught me how to draw. And of course, eventually I, I embraced the art world and you know, came to Savannah, Georgia to attend the art school here, uh, the Savannah College of Art and Design. But as a child, we were just very endeared to her. In fact, I still have the letters that she wrote to me when I was an infant. Um, but when she was, when I was maybe seven or eight years of age, and I would have to, you know, ask my mother about this, she developed Alzheimer's and she basically passed away. Um, you know, my, my family had set up a residence for her uh, to be closer to us in my hometown, Illinois. And she passed away when I was nine. And that is when death really became a notion to me because suddenly this kind of heroine or hero of mine was gone, this other mother type who, you know, was almost even more motherly and mothering than my own mother. Um, no disrespect, of course, to mom. But it's just true. I mean, she was very warm and spiritual. And so I'm sure my own way I was heartbroken. I don't have distinct memories of that, except I, I have distinct memories of my mother coming home from the hospital and 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 other caretaking situations when my when my grandmother was near her end and just the wailing in the house. Like my mother is not a greatly emotional person, even to this day. Um, I think she manages her emotions very well and it works for her. But I just remember mom walking in the door, especially after Coco died and just hearing the wailing and, and associating that immediately with an understanding that this is how death sounds. Okay. This is how death resonates in the home. And, uh, you know, so those are my first, you know, childhood impressions of death. You know, other than, of course, being aware of the notion, um, that was the most personal minute. Um, but it's interesting, again, you know, um, that kind of impact. And so, 
you know, like a lot of suburban kids from the Midwest, I think I, I grew up in a very um, shielded kind of uh, comfortable life in, in many respects, although it was not an easy life, but, you know, death was not, um, oh, I don't know, just always around, you know, so I, I don't know how we can really talk about that, you know, was I blessed to not be around death or, you know, because obviously people grow up in horrible situations where there, you know, there's constant death, but it would be many, many years before I would, you know, experience an, another death that was close to me. So that's, anyway, that, that's, you know, in, in response to your, your question there, that's my earliest memory. Mm -hmm. And so then how does someone come from that to like building a life and a career around death when the majority of people do not, <laughs> the majority <laughs> of people, this would not be on their, uh, you know, top three hopeful careers. Guidance counselors are typically not uh, helping you know, move people into the direction of, of, of death, death care, death conversation, tour guides of cemeteries. Um, can you help fill in the gaps there? <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> how you ended up uh, here today? Well, you know, I think now that you and I are sitting here speaking, I'm, I'm having this interesting reflection that um, probably with my, my grandmother's artistic influence meets I was the adopted child in the family, so I already had a little bit of a, a unique perspective on growing up um, and being different, quote unquote. Um, it made me a little more inward and reflective and meditative and an observer type. Um, and I love looking at the world and the beauty of nature and all kinds of things like that. And that, and I was drawn to certain types of music that were also very melancholic. Um, you know, be it the Cocteau Twins or the Cure or Depeche Mode or, you know, just it was a little bit on the darker side um, and but very uplifting and inspiring. And it, it struck me as being a, a kind of intelligence about life and death inside of music. So, you know, one of my escapes from my hometown, and it was a small farming town in the middle of Illinois um, that was both an Air Force base driven city and or town and a farming town. So there was a cemetery from the 1840s just on the edge of town on a little hill called Maplewood Cemetery. And it was surrounded by cornfields and a railroad track that ran through the town, ran by that cemetery. And that's where I would like go hang out, you know, either on my own to read or um, just wander among the headstones and, and absorb inscriptions and you know, uh, names and get intrigued by old world names and how those names were gone. So that aesthetic washed over me and, and really a combination of those things, you know, and, and plus I worked in the cemetery eventually in high school. So, I mean, I've dug graves and I've painted ironwork and I've fixed headstones and did landscaping and the community actually really, uh, at, at the end of that high school hour of my life, um, paid me a big compliment and told me, that the cemetery had not looked that good in 25 years. So that's the feeling I took out of a cemetery world into, let's say, the art world of Savannah in my life here. That was a good feeling and a way to leave your hometown on. But, you know, that, that eventually just became a natural place for me to gravitate to. And also bear in mind that my school teacher parents during the summers took my brother and I around to all of the major state parks, national parks. You know, Williamsburg was kind of my you know, uh, Disney World. Uh, I, and we saw a lot of old cemeteries too, you know, in those travels. But, you know, just coming to a town like Savannah, which has, you know, a couple great graveyards and a lot of cool cemeteries, you know, and it seemed like an artist town. So, you know, I really feel like I just kind of graduated to the next level of all that just by moving to Savannah and and I'm honestly not a fan of the modern world. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in the headspace of the old, uh, which is a cool way to live in the modern world, FYI. Um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a natural born escapist. Um, so yeah, cemeteries have always been my escape, my go-to. Um, you know, looking back to on just my, my hometown life, you know, like when I had a girlfriend or two, like that's where we went on dates. 
you know, I thought it was just like romantic to take a girl to a cemetery. I mean, I'm telling you, like I would, I, and this sounds really, you know, uh, flamboyant or something, but I would bake a quiche. I mean, I'm 17 or 18. I would bake a quiche at home, my parents' home. I would get the picnic blanket. I had like an old vintage picnic basket and we would go to the cemetery. And although this is kind of a no-no, but some of those big marble vaults were sizable and flat. So I would stretch the picnic blanket across the top of the, the, literal, the literal tombs of someone. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm breaking all the rules by talking about this. And we would, we would bathe, and it was sturdy enough. It wasn't gonna collapse, you know, but we would get on top of it and I would lay out the quiche I had made. And there we are under the stars above, you know? And so again, this, this is just how my life aesthetic got defined. I, I always felt history and cemeteries were the most, the greatest places to be in touch with like romantic life feelings, not death, but life feelings. So that's, that's really some of the background. Mm -hmm. I, I actually find that very relatable. So I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, no, listen, we yeah. you know, people like people like us need help. You know, we, I, we've got, I know. We've got to commiserate and group together. Oh, I love getting a, a big, healthy meal and just going to the cemetery by myself and eating it. It's, it's like one of the most like romantic self dates that I take myself on. So yeah. Well, and and they're good to, you know, work off the meal too, walking around the the many roads yeah. and paths, you know. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, okay. So you come to Savannah and how, so you, you came there for art and then now you have this tour company. Um, how, how did that begin? Did that kind of fall in your lap in some way, or did you see something was missing and you wanted it done, you know, the Shannon Scott way? Uh -huh. Well, the, yeah, all of the above, we'll check that box. Um, you know, when I, I left the art school after two and a half years, um, because I was more enraptured, I think, by the surrounding low country and Savannah's, like I always tell people that, you know, uh, SCAD was the excuse to, in a way, get to Savannah. Savannah was really the mission. Um, I was spending more time at the Georgia Historical Society. My grades were tanking in result, honestly. But I wanted that tangible old, and that's where you could get your fingers on it and smell the aging book paper and all that. And I had a lot of adventures, you know, around that. And so I'm like, okay, well, how can I stay in a city that has only a couple of opportunities for people without degrees? Um, I mean, you're either going to work in restaurants, which I did. I worked as a chef, or you're going to be a tour guide, or you're going to work for the Port of Savannah, which did not really appeal to me. And I didn't know a whole lot about it, to be honest. But um, I knew that I, I was a good storyteller, that people had always looked to me for knowledge and information ever since I was young. And, and I thought, okay, well, that's, a, that's a, a gift. You know, how can I capitalize on that? Um, and it was, you know, uh, while I was waiting tables and chefing, um, I got a tour guide license when I was 20 years of age and maybe 19, but Nonetheless, that was a difficult thing to get way back in the day. Now they kind of hand them out like candy. But I mean, you had to study a big manual and take a four hour test. And I mean, it was something to accomplish. But nonetheless, um, I started giving carriage tours and um, realizing that I did not like traffic and driving around in traffic, you know, carriage or not. I drove trolleys and buses, too. And, but I, walking tours were not a thing yet. And I knew that I just wanted to be in the squares of Savannah, the 24 squares, because that's the way the city had been laid out to be kind of a walking city. And so I, a guy from Charleston came to Savannah, started a walking tour company. I built all of his tours and jumped on that. Um, but I also knew I wanted to do my own thing. And, you know, the, the long story made short is that you know, I, I was blessed, you know, you heard me mention my, my mother's father. Um, turns out when I was 25, he, he left me uh, a coal mine. And the coal mine had no coal, but the real estate had value to the coal company. So I sold that. And what that allowed me to do was to not pay bills for a year. I didn't have to pay rent or utilities. I could just, you know, so I opened a publishing company which uh, had always been a dream because Ben Franklin was a hero and he always defined himself as a publisher. 
So through him, I wanted to, I wanted to have a publishing company. I, I believe in greater information. That's kind of my life philosophy. So I started a publishing company. I published cool maps for seven years and that allowed me to get more into the independent businessman type, you know, mentality or whatever. I'm not really a businessman. I just kind of like know how to put creative ideas into money making, you know, venues or something. But, you know, I was like, all right, I'm tired of working for other people um, with the tours anyway, because I still did that while I had the publishing. Um, I decided to open up my own company and part of the handwriting was on the wall. And I think you'll appreciate this, Jenna. Um, in 2001, I realized that no one had reserved BonaventureCemetery.com <laughs> and nobody was touring out there. And I was like, you know, this is the next big thing. I know it is. And partly because of the novel Midnight in the Garden of Evil, which was about Savannah and it was a big, you know, record shattering novel. And the cemetery was featured throughout Clint Eastwood, you know, made a movie about it and all that. So I'm like, I'm thinking, okay, this is where I want to go because this is my original love, if you will. So I just secured it. And, you know, at first it was like a tour a week, a, you know, a couple tours a month. I mean, it was really slow. And now, you know, if you, if you were to come to Bonaventure, you'd be shocked because it gets about a million visitors a year and there are, you know, 20 tour companies operating through there, you know, but I was really the first on the ground and, and I've since cap and, you know, captured other cemeteries um, through the, through the tour opportunities as well. So now, you know, for the real TAFO files or the lovers of cemeteries, when they come to Savannah, um, they can tour as, as many as seven cemeteries with me, you know, which is unique. I mean, I don't know how many individuals really offer that out there in the world, probably not too many. So, you know, I feel like uh, that that's a blessing and, you know, makes, makes my life in Savannah and Savannah a, a special life. But it's also about, connecting people with concepts of, I think, life and death. And I like to think, you know, you heard me mention, we've got an ambulance going by, but I like to think, you know, when we were kind of highlighting uh, living energies and life energy inside of cemeteries, you know, to be celebrative of life, most people don't have that in a conventional wisdom thought about them. So I like to be the, if you will, the, uh, not the death doula, but the story guide, you know, uh, doula that is uh, making these subjects more inspiring, uh, energetically uplifting, uh, maybe making, in almost like the true Victorian idea, you know, death is simply a transition hour, you know, and it's not the end, you know, which is my kind of personal stance on that. But, you know, I, th I think I make cemeteries a, a healthier idea. <laughs> yeah, mm. that can be said so um I wonder if you have some insight into this so as I've been on this journey of of having conversations you know I've learned that it's only in the last you know 100 years that we stopped taking care of our death our dead people right like in in the past we would take care of them mm. when they died but yep. now we sort of handed that off to medical institutions um are cemeteries, do they also have sort of like a, a changed history of how we experience them? Whereas now people are like, oh, that's weird that you want to spend time in there. That's creepy. That's scary. Were they yeah. viewed as scary, unwelcoming places? Um, I mean, it depends on how far back in ancient history you want to go. Um, I think the ancients probably, um, it's a, it, like it is today, it's a mix you know, when you look out at how cultures dealt with death celebration or the use of death as a, a fear tactic to kind of rule people, I, I find that, that that's also a way of looking at it. And not only the Puritan age, the Victorian age, but also the modern age, it's just, you find it's a mix of attitudes, a mix of, um, it has a mix of roles, I guess, uh, or purposes. But um, I think in the Puritan age of the colonial times, it really is death is the end, it's gloom and doom. You know, you look at it, the, a typical graveyard headstone in a churchyard and you see it, you know, it's really scary. It's, it's meant to be scary. And I almost think that's a, a control tactic that religion, some religion attempted to use, but also to, to know that death is kind of a serious thing, right? Um, the Victorian response to that was much more of death is, you know, merely a moment and you open your eyes in the next world, 
the second after you close them in this world. And you find a lot of that monument art and memorializing done that way. And, and you, you pointed it out, I think, very well in that we used to, you know, people used to die in their homes. Hospitals were kind of a foreign, strange idea We're all, unless you just had a family that wanted to do that. Um, you know, every house had a dying room. There were all kinds of traditions around uh, the wake and the funerary hours. The families were very hands-on. I think it's all quite beautiful. Um, I see that in the, in the low country south where I am, I see like the Gullah Geechee people and some of the more African uh, originated cultures, they still do a lot of hands-on stuff uh, with the wake ideas, with the family making the headstones, with the family all inscribing the headstones. Um, that's still very tactile in some of that coastal culture uh, of let's say the African tradition. You know, I think in the conventional um, Anglican tradition. Uh, now it's, as you noted, it's been, you know, pawned off on the medical and the more clinical, um, taken out of the home, if you will. I mean, I get it. Like who wants to hang out with a dead body or something, but at the same time, there's, it was, it was a person that you loved and, you know, and, and obviously some of that attitude has changed. You know, my father recently passed away late last year and I didn't know until we were all in the hospital room with my father what my mother or my brother wanted for dad. And it just, it was not a subject that was ever brought up because mom and dad were very, I think, kind of contemporary and, and practical in those ways. But it turns out my dad wanted to be cremated. That was news to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I was, I was almost a little, I don't want to say upset. I was a little disappointed. I was like, oh man, I wanted to like, you know, have like, uh, a headstone at least for my dad. And I think we'll probably do that in a family plot, but you know, he wasn't traditionally buried. I'd been used to going to my grandparents' funerals, which were open casket, you know, that whole thing, um, which I think that's almost even creepier, like, you know, because you're, you're not in the process as, as the Victorians and other cultures, you know, other eras had been where it is all in the house. And you know, let's face it, some of that was very impractical for a lot of different reasons, you know, the heat, uh, the unembalmed or whatever, but, but there was a beauty to it too. And the whole like memento mori photography of, of posing with the loved one before they were buried. I mean, I respect the heck out of that stuff. Um, but as you noted, and, and, and it's very true today, it's, it's not the same ritualistic process or memorialization process, which, you know, had it has its costs even now. And the money was very different 150 years ago. It was even the money was more valuable and you could almost afford to do more of that. Today, it's like, you know, hey, do we have this money for this and this and this and this? Like we just went through the hospital and da 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 da. So I hate to say it, but it's become almost like a lot. It's been steered more to a practical place if just from the kind of the failure of our money system in a way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh. Like the death, the industry, like the fact that it's like an industry where people yeah. have, you know, boards and uh, corporate structures and, you know, bottom lines and all these things related to the end of humans' lives. It's such a strange disconnect for me as I sort of like unravel how all of this works because I haven't had a lot of death in my life that I've had to be a part of the end for. I've just had, mm -hmm. you know, parents or other family members take care of it. So um, I haven't been sort of upfront with some of those things that now are, are quite shocking um, and really exploit people in their times of, you know, sadness and grief and crisis. Um, yeah. Um, and can I, if I can interject, and I apologize if I'm interrupting, um, but I, before I forget, I wanted to, if I could tell you kind of a, a related cool story. Absolutely. Okay. So. When I moved to Savannah, 1988, there was not an art gallery here. There was not a coffee house here. This was a very one horse kind of town, sleepy, 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 beautiful, frozen in time. A lot of empty buildings and quirky old families living in the surviving houses. I mean, I was here at a very charmed time before it all blew up and became like, you know, the, the new Austin or Santa Fe or, you know, whatever you want to call it. So you had to make your own fun and, but you're also hyper aware of just the slightest pin drop in the city. 
And so the Gullah Geechee culture that I've referenced, who are the uh, descendants of the Angolan slaves, they, some of those families, when I at least first moved here, they still practice what they call the sit up. And they sit up all night with the body in the house and they serve coffee and bread and they beat a, beat a traditional African drum. And there was a famous drum making family in Savannah that um, came from Africa and in Africa were also drum makers and that can, that survived slavery, let's say. And so some of those drums are still around and highly collected. And, and I don't know if they're still in the, the craft of that or not, but sometimes you'd be on your front porch downtown at one in the morning and it, it is quiet in Savannah, Georgia. I mean, no sirens, no horns, maybe a ship on the river, you know, blowing by, but you would then suddenly hear boom, 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 boom. And it's that funeral drum in someone's house, like across town beating for the sit up. And it would beat all night long. Like you could come back like two hours later and you would still hear that steady beat of that funeral drum in someone's house. And you knew it wasn't just some like hippie kid, you know, beating on a bongo, you know, it was like a real sit up happening. And it just had the eeriest effect, you know, across like the nightscape of Savannah. But I was so like entranced by it. Absolutely. You know, so again, I don't know if that still goes on because Savannah has become a very noisy place. Yeah. It's become a very noisy city and it's very busy with itself. So I don't know if that still goes on in Savannah or not. I need to look into that. But at one time you could really experience it, you know, just in the periphery, a part mm -hmm. of this, the night is the night sounds of Savannah like an invitation for everyone to be a part ah, of it. To, yeah. to be acknowledging, yeah. And I, I certainly acknowledge the fact that that was going on in that real, you know, mm -hmm. spiritual place for that family. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, I just it just came to mind as we were talking. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. The, the different ways that we we honor the dead, right? And the, the mm -hmm. passing. So um, I poked around a little. I saw the word <laughs> supernatural come up a couple of times in mm -hmm. relation to you. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about that? What does supernatural mean to you? How how does that play a role in your life now? Sure. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'll be the first to admit, um, I cash in heavily. <laughs> I mean, I was I was the second ghost tour guide of a regular in Savannah. Um, there was Jack Richards, who was really the father of the ghost tour industry in Savannah. He did this kind of higher brow, intelligent tour. And my, I was not into the ghost stuff at all. I mean, as an artist, like I understood like the spiritual role of ghosts and the, the meanings and, you know, I mean, things like, you know, in, in ancient or older poetry, you know, images of specters and all that, but I didn't really give it a lot of personal credence, credence. And, you know, I knew that it was a part of the Savannah culture before there were ghost tours, there were people actively talking about it. There was a, a very notable book, which is still a top seller in Savannah. It was published in the 80s called Savannah Specters by Margaret Waite DeBolt. And she was here during key seances with like the demonologist, the Warrens, uh, Sybil Leak, the witch, uh, doing kind of seances or mediumship in homes. So she had this interesting journalist perspective. She wrote a book about it. It's still considered kind of the Bible text of the ghost or industry, still a top seller in any bookstore in Savannah. Uh, but you know, when when my employer in the 90s of the walking tour company said that ghost tours were becoming a thing in Charleston, he thought it was going to be the next big thing in Savannah. I really poo pooed on it. But when we came to terms that if I could design it to be a true story um, and be true to Savannah, then that would be my my demand. So he allowed me to go out and 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 do that. And, and just as a pure historical journalist type person. I, I typed up a letter inviting the conversation. I went to Kinko's and printed out a thousand letters. And I went on foot to every building with a mail slot or a crack under the door big enough in a business or whatever. And I put that under the door. And I got a lot of interesting responses, a lot of interviews. I found out that a lot of these famous parapsychologists and um you know, even like psychics like Yuri Geller, 
I mean, these people had done stuff in Savannah and I wanted to know what that was. So through a combination of real personal interviews with people in their homes who had had experiences to tracking down some of the famous people like the Warrens, uh, like the Leap family and talking to them about their Savannah connection and endeavors, I was able to build a tour that I felt was credible. And this was my way of acknowledging that this was a part of Savannah culture. It wasn't just a trend. It was a real history here. Now, as time went on, I had a very spiritual out-of-body experience of my own, which was in 1999. And that opened my eyeballs to really what we would call the, the true supernatural. Like I was raised in a you know, Methodist kind of an almost Episcopalian household, um, Protestant, I guess, too. It's at one point, you know, the family tried out different churches. But nonetheless, I, you know, had biblical, you know, understanding of, of life and things like that. But, you know, ghosts seemed kind of hokey. Um, I'd been on some ghost tours, too, before I even scripted the one I built. And, you know, I just, they didn't appeal to me. Um, and mostly they still don't, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, um, once I had that out-of-body experience, I had what I would call a meeting with the creator. Um, I learned a little more about my purpose. Um, it was absolutely mind-blowing and fascinating as an experience. And, you know, and I, it just put me on a different course. Um, you know, I, I, I can't make incredible, incredible big claims about it, except it changed my life in a positive way. And, um, it just set my life on a more kind of a spiritual path. I know that's sort of a cliche thing, but it, it was very meaningful in the way it, it made me a better person or allowed me to make myself a better person. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I've, I've forever been interested in the interdimensional, the many mechanics of the universe, um, you know, the, the many opinions and theories, you know, I'm not, even though, again, I cashed in on the industry, the interest, I always tried to make it a little more smart, a little more intelligent, um, you know, and uh, I don't, in some cases, we'll call it highbrow, if that's, if I can say that, but uh, I was not the guy that really wanted to run into a building and, and investigate ghosts. I'm not the guy that likes to, you know, uh, go to all the ghost investigations. I mean, I worked for the ghost TV shows. I did all that stuff. I worked for some of the biggest ones. Um, so I had my hands in it and I realized it was a way to make a living, you know, but I was also kind of, I guess, honing this um, interest in the spirit world too. But it's more about that life is spiritual, that life is, you know, but a dream. I mean, it's, it's, such a mystifying mystical place and that almost every operation in life has a spirit to it it has a physical existential mechanic obviously it can be talked about scientifically but you know even when you get down in the depths of science i just find a lot of spirituality and movement of, of spiritual things that just speak to all the connectivity and you know it's just you know again i think i almost see the spiritual and the existential is like the same thing just talked about in a different lens. So supernatural is my preferred term because uh, I think it's an older term than, you know, paranormal. Um, and, you know, and so when people come to Savannah and they, they want to hang out with me because I, I don't do uh, public ghost tours anymore personally, but I do a, a really top shelf supernatural tour of the city. And if they really are just like looking for the, the ultimate deep dive, you know, from somebody that kind of wrote the script on a lot of this stuff, then that's what I, you know, offer as a service. And um, so, yeah, but I, the word now that I find most applicable is interdimensional. Hmm. Um, I feel like we're seeing even physics addressing things like zero point energy with uh, these ideas of different dimensions around us. And I've, I've witnessed that too, by the way, I've, in, I've actually witnessed zero point energy in action in the company of another person where we saw uh, basically something come into a room in an 1850s house we both saw a portal open up in the corner of the ceiling and that entity move through that portal and then we watched that portal close it had sound everything um 
so I believe, you know, I believe in the quote unquote spirit world. You know, I feel like we're just living in it all the time. And sometimes we get these kind of like, you know, you know, what, what the heck moments um, where we really just see it, you know, experience it. Uh, but it's always operating around us. And I think it speaks to the fact like Conrad Aiken, who's the poet buried in Bonaventure. I mean, he very much subscribed to like this idea of the universal substance and that, you know, when we die, we go back to that place and that really there is no death. And I kind of subscribe to that. And it's not really a fear thing. It's not a fear of death. It's really like, I've just seen enough in my life to realize that energy changes forms, it transitions, it, it, it's kind of reborn in a, and regenerated in a different way. So it's really, it's more, it's more of a knowing, as Carl Jung said, than a belief. You know, it's a knowing that, you know, death is but a moment. It's, it's really a moment of transition and regeneration. So that's, that's you know, my knowing. And beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Well, sure. I mean, you know, it's a very long-winded answer, but yeah. you know, it makes your job easier, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, going back to Bonaventure. So I ended up there. I, yes. in my morning meditations one day, so I started this pod, I don't even know if I would started the podcast or not. So in my morning meditation, all of a sudden I was hit with this, go to Savannah. I was like, what's in Savannah? I booked a flight, didn't know what was in Savannah. So a couple of days before I, I have to go, it, it was like a week out from when I booked the, the flight. I was like, what, what to do in Savannah? And it just goes to her like cemetery. I was like, oh, this is like a death. This is a, this is like a death hub. This <laughs> Savannah is a place where people go when they want to explore, you know, ghosts and supernatural and cemeteries. And so who knows why that message came to me. I'd never thought of Savannah. I knew it existed, but knew nothing of it. Um, hmm. I quickly watched the movie uh, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, so I could get a sense yes. of what I was getting into. And then I and then I ended up there, and I went on a tour of Bonaventure. Um, and I mean, it was the most beautiful cemetery I've ever been in. Mm. Um, I haven't been in many, but mm -hmm. the cemeteries I have been in are either quite new. I I live in you know. Ontario, Canada, it's not that old, um, or or in um, like Eastern Europe. I've been to a lot of Eastern Europe cemeteries. Oh, um, lovely. What do you think draws people to Bonaventure? Um, I think it's such a sumptuous landscape um, against the water, high above the water. So it's not, you know, a lakeside experience in a sense or a flat experience. It's, it's multidimensional. Mm -hmm. um, you know, towering live oak trees with just breathtaking canopies, you know, endless Spanish moss, you know, just kind of swaying. I mean, it, the landscape itself is putting on a mysterious show. And then you throw in, you know, high art from wonderful sculptors from Italy and Germany and America and, you know, and that those have dimension. So it's this outdoor art museum inside of an old plantation and you just feel the age, you feel the spirituality. And I do wanna kind of throw this in the mix too about the feeling. Um, this is something that's come into more of a definition for me in recent years, but, but Oglethorpe that founded Georgia in the 1730s, he befriended an Indian Mica or an Indian King, uh, Tamachichi and Tamachichi was, um, an it's a Mayan descendant. So he could claim, you know, Mayan bloodlines and um, some of his kingly ancestors were also buried outside of what is downtown Savannah and in mounds that sadly were destroyed. But he described to Oglethorpe and they were extremely good friends. And I don't, I don't know if you know this or not but it may be interesting to your watchers but Oglethorpe was six foot 11 and Tomachichi was seven foot one. Wow. And, these, and as far as I, I'm concerned, for the six years that they knew each other, and, and Tom and Chi Chi basically died in Oglethorpe's arms when he was 96. Um, so he had seen a long life before he met the, uh, the 40 or 32 year old uh, British captain Oglethorpe. Um, but nonetheless, um, Tom and Chi Chi expressed to Oglethorpe, who himself was a mystic, he was a 32nd degree Scottish Rite. Uh, he had spent a lot of time in his teenage life in the Vatican. 
that's a whole other story. He had access to what we'll call forbidden libraries, you know, had wisdom of the ancients as a teenager in a very literal way through Vatican libraries. So he was an interesting fellow to say the least. But nonetheless, Tom Achichi expressed to Oglethorpe that his people, meaning his ancestors, did not live where downtown Savannah, historic district Savannah is, also did not live in the land that became Bonaventure Plantation, Bonaventure Cemetery, because they were sacred spaces to his people. And he had no further explanation that I know of or have heard anybody utter or write about or what have you to as to why these were sacred spaces to his people. But he felt it important to tell Oglethorpe that they did not live here or in those places like Bonaventure for that understanding. Now, granted, you know, Tomachichi, whose tribe was in a desperate place um, you know, from disease and war and all the rest, politics. I mean, he sold or, or bargained to sell what is now downtown Savannah to Oglethorpe. Um, so I don't know what we can make of that. But Bonaventure was already mysterious to a mystical people like the, the Muskegee Creek tribe. Um, so I, I believe there's an interdimensional side to it. It may have also been a burial place of the ancients. When you look at old paintings and illustrations of Bonaventure, there appear to be almost like burial mound type uh, elevations in the land when they first started using it as a cemetery. Mm -hmm. That could just be my interpretation, but I kind of wonder if there wasn't something uh, here that may have been destroyed by a hurricane you know, other natural, whatever, or the plantation hours. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody's really sure, but I think it's real fascinating that this king of a fascinating king of an Indian tribe called the Yamacra had already denoted Bonaventure to be this mystical place. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I won't, I won't disagree with that, but I think it's very much a part of the feeling that you're asking about that people are in touch with energetically the minute they walk in other than just the hypnotic, obvious beauty of the place, you know, mm -hmm. it's a part of the enchantment. Yeah. So, I mean, um, just to give the entertainment to the people, <laughs> <laughs> people, people go to cemeteries, probably on tours because they want to hear, you know, spooky stories and yep. things that are hard to believe. Uh, yeah. Do you want to share some of those about Bonaventure, some of your favorite stories or things that, you know, give you goosebumps or, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, this is an easy grab, you know, it's an easy audience sell, but little Gracie Watson, uh, that is the almost seven year old, you know, girl statue that I describe as the shrine in Savannah where people go to pay alms, you know, in that I still think, you know, from a historian perspective, she, her statue done by John Walls in um, really 1880, 1890, 91. I mean, you know, she was unveiled there, I think, in 1891. But, you know, he worked on her statue for about a year and a half. He knew her personally. She was the closest thing he ever knew to a child in his own life that we're aware of. I mean, he was 63 when he married and did not have children. Um, but, you know, his brother worked in the hotel where she lived and he interacted with her and then, you know, She's obviously a light in the city, but her statue is, the, I think, the most important piece of portrait art ever sculpted locally. Um, I don't think too many people will contest that much. Um, so I think, you know, a part of the ritual for any visitor is that you have to come to Savannah. You must go to Bonaventure and become a part of what we call the family of little Gracie. It's like, you know, the, even the old saying, she adopts every passerby, every passerby adopts her you know, bespeaks volumes about that importance. Um, otherwise, you just haven't really done Savannah. I mean, whether you like cemeteries or not, you at least have to go visit little Gracie and keep her company, you know. I mean, her, <laughs> par her parents moved away and, you know, buried in, in New York. Yeah. Um, but, you know, one of the, the stories that came across my plate was from the great grandchildren of the Getman family who last lived on Bonaventure's property in the old Sexton house that is now the office for the cemetery department. 
And they expressed that there was a lot of rumors and a lot of fabrication about their family stories. And they had, they reached out to me to share uh, a, a bit of a trove of stories. But the one that stands out, which I think there are others like it, and, and they all have meaning in the same way, happened to the family in 1960. Um, there was great grandma Getman and grandma Getman, and they were in the house at the front of Bonaventure. And I think they moved out in, a, in another three years and, and became really a true city office. But this was one of the last experiences they had. And grandma Getman and great grandma Getman were in the house alone. It was late at night, cemetery closed, you know, eight hours early or something. And a woman joined them from the town of Thunderbolt where Bonaventure is. And it's just three ladies in the parlor. They've got screen doors on the front and the back. You know, the vent, the uh, river breeze is coming through the house in the hot summer. And they hear a noise at the back door. And they look and they see this young girl at the back door with her nose pressed in on the screen. Her hands are up on the screen. And she's looking at them in this obviously very investigative way. But it's an uncanny moment with a girl on her own late at night, you know, the back door of the cemetery. But the Getman women could not speak because they realized this girl 100% resembled little Gracie in every detail. They said the button, and I'm quoting the family, the buttons on the dress were identical. The buttons on the boots were exactly the same. And, you know, it was clearly fashion of the Victorian period. Um, so the family friend though is just seeing this strange little girl and she casually speaks up for the three. She says, excuse us little girls or something we can do for you. And all three women watched her withdraw her hands and start walking in reverse to the top of the steps at the uh, edge of the porch. And she stops there and they kind of see her in the, you know, maybe the very um, fading light or whatever. And they stepped up to the door and as they're looking at her through the screen and she's kind of holding their gaze, she walked backwards down the steps. She stopped briefly for another moment and kind of looked at them. And then very peculiar, she walks in reverse back out into the cemetery. <laughs> like backs into, the, which, you know, measuring that, we're talking, she's walking backwards a hundred feet or more. I mean, it doesn't get any stranger. Now, the Getman women still speechless. The family friend spoke up and said, oh, I'm going to go after her. <laughs> now, when she opened the door and an icy breeze sucked into the house and she stepped onto the porch, Grandma Getman lunged for her and yanked her back into the house and said, don't you dare. And when they explained to her whom they believe it was, um, she began to tremble and cry with her own understanding. And that night, all three of them went to a bar in Thunderbolt and they ordered themselves the biggest shot that they've ordered themselves in their lives <laughs> because they believed they had just been visited. And I think it's safe to say by little Gracie. Now, um, I, I would come to find that that was not an isolated story. At first, I thought it was just extremely unique and one of a one off, one of a kind. And then one day I was standing in front of the little Gracie in the middle of my uh, statue in the middle of my tour. And there was a woman standing at the edge of the, the fence surrounding Gracie, and she just kept looking at me, looking at Gracie, looking at me, looking at Gracie. I mean, she was eagerly, intensely listening to what I had to say. And I thought, okay, you know, this happens now and again. It wasn't making much of it. So she was very being very polite, and I could tell she was waiting to inject something. And so I, I finished my story, and she said, do you, do you mind if I tell you something? I said, no. She said, well... You know, I'm 68, but when I was a little girl, I remembered the family that lived in the house um, that, you know, was in the early days of the brick house. And she, you know, named the family. And um, I said, oh, yeah, I'm familiar. And she said, well, you know, they're all gone now. You know, they're all dead. But I remember when I was a little girl, they would they would, the women of the family said they would sit on the back porch at night in rocking chairs and little Gracie flesh and blood would walk out of the cemetery up the steps and she would be standing just a few feet from where they were sitting and, and would vanish into a puff of smoke. Now, I will tell you, um, as the skeptic 
historian kind of rooted person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I understand embellishment and all the rest, but I've developed a very good radar for the feeling of people's life stories mm -hmm. and where maybe they're kind of stretching the truth or not or blah, blah, blah. And I'll tell you, when you work in the ghost television industry, you learn pretty quickly about all of the the wishful thinking and 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 all the crazy tales and and you know who's really telling you the, the real stuff. So I've decided that the stories of the families that I've heard, both directly and indirectly from people that knew them, are not just wives' tales or stories to kind of you know intrigue the kids or scare the kids. I really have come to the belief, and hence my term interdimensional, that they did have those encounters, that they are authentic, and they're really just talking about those experiences for no other purpose but to say, wow, this, this amazing thing actually happened to us and we weren't alone in observing it. And that's the most distinct characteristic I could, I could offer you about mm -hmm. the supernatural in Savannah, Georgia, is how there is a plethora of discussion of lifelike spirits and flesh and blood encounters. And, you know, the Gullah Geechee culture almost finds that normal, um, especially if it's a relative of theirs. Um, but it's not something that I grew up with, that I was oriented around. You know, this has all been my, you know, education here in Savannah. Mm -hmm. Incredible. So when you go to a new cemetery, when you're you know, out in the world, and you might find one you've never been to before. What are some of the things that pique your interest or you're looking for? What makes a good cemetery experience for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, it has to have, I think, landscape design plus, you know, like Rose Hill Cemetery in Macon, Georgia is one of the greats. Um, you know, it was designed by Olmsted uh, that did Central Park. And it's really one of the, the most exquisite landscape designs in the world. And more people should go to Macon, Georgia to see how otherworldly and god awful beautiful that place is. I mean, again, Bonaventure is, is the bread and butter. I'll never, you know, you know, uh, bite the hand that feeds or down <laughs> it, but I kind of know the order of like the top 10, you know, in a sense. And, you know, you've got Greenwood Cemetery in New York, which is king. Um, and then you have, you could argue either Rose Hill in the South is the bookend of Greenwood or Metairie Cemetery in, uh, outside of New Orleans is, is the Southern bookend of the King or the Queen of, of cemeteries. It's a toss up to me, but Rose Hill has even Metairie beat on the, the landscape design. Olmsted just put every imaginative, you know, brain cell into that place. So I love that combination of ancient ruins meets, you know, winding roads that you can't see around the corner of, but you know something delicious awaits you, or that's the aspiration. And then the statuary has to be, you know, carving second to none. I mean, it just has to be above average. And then, you know, you start finding the stories and, you know, the stories are mind blowing in Victorian cemeteries. I mean, just who you find buried there, or how they died, and it's always unexpected. It's always a surprise. So I love being surprised by cemeteries. I kind of let them do their thing and, you know, guide me through in a way, but they have to have whispers of those aesthetical elements that I've mentioned to really, you know, capture me. But I'm also, you know, I'm a, I'm a sleuth in that I kind of have a nose for cemeteries. Like I can be driving down the road and I almost smell one. I mean, <laughs> literally, I'm, I'm that dialed in. It's crazy, man. It's a vibration, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But I mean, I, I know the old landscapes of the old properties and I just kind of know where a cemetery is. And sometimes, man, more times than not, I'm, my hunch is right. And I'll pull off to the side of the road and I'll find that cemetery. And, you know, there's something amazing inside of it. Like, you know, the plantation house or whatever might be gone, but there's the little family graveyard or cemetery. And then you find that person that, you know, lived to 116, you know, and you're like, whoa, you know, and it made the whole trip worth it. You know, maybe you drove around for eight hours and wanderlust and, 
you know, you just find that one headstone that just like, wow, you know, and that's major day. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm not above just little humble burial spaces, you know, it's just, there's always something in them. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a photo plaque or something that someone left on the grave. It can be just a simple place. Um, I'm entertained by them all or, or infatuated with them all, but you know, there are some real classics, you know, that are the, the wonders of the cemetery world mm -hmm. I mean, without a doubt. And, you know, I can, I can highlight those, but you know, Richmond, Virginia's Hollywood Cemetery is one of the greats. Um, Westview Cemetery in Atlanta, Georgia, Oakland Cemetery in Atlanta, Georgia, Magnolia Cemetery in Charleston, um, you know, uh, Metairie Cemetery, as we mentioned, uh, along with Greenwood Cemetery in, in New Orleans, Metairie there. Um, there are just so many great, great cemeteries. You know, I've, I've been blessed to see many of them, especially in the South. Right. I'm going to add all this to my list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you, I mean, it's, it's so crazy how, I mean, the Allman brothers are buried in Rose Hill Cemetery. They wrote about Rose Hill Cemetery and their music. Um, you know, they hung out there as kids and did all that stuff. But, you know, most people don't really think of going to Macon, Georgia. I mean, it's a beautiful city with god awful amazing architecture. I mean, maybe god awful is the wrong word, but just amazing architecture. Um, but that cemetery all by itself, I mean, there should be plane loads of arborists, uh, preservationists, historians, archaeologists. I mean, all of the educator, you know, academic passion world should be trying hard to get to Macon, Georgia to go to Rose Hill Cemetery. And again, not to deter people from coming to Bonaventure. That's almost become a foregone conclusion. But you know, I like to put the name Rose Hill out there because I don't think it's one that enough people think enough of. I'm almost, I'm almost okay with the fact that it's a hidden gem and it's not overrun by tourists, but I mean, that day is coming for Macon. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I love that. So <laughs> originally when I started this podcast, it was sort of with this very limited idea that talking about death would inspire people to make the most of their life, which I think, I think that it, it's going to do um, mm -hmm. as a byproduct, but it's become like so much more. Mm -hmm. With that said, um, are there any words you want to leave for the living <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> on, you know, wisdom you've come along maybe with your um, experience that you mentioned earlier? Um, yeah. Any, any words for the living from someone who spent so much time with the dead? Well, I mean, I feel like, you know, and this does come from a personal place. And I think some of the cliches are, are very good. I mean, I, I really do subscribe to the idea that there is only life, there is no death. And I'm not, you know, clear, obviously not the first to say that great avatars of history have said very similar things. Um, and that, you know, you know, invest as much as you can in your health. Um, you know, love the people around you. Like it is, it is your job and the most important thing because it's so fleeting time, especially as, you know, you cross like the 50 mark, you know, you realize that. And then, yeah, the people you love, like your parents, you know, uh, go by the way. Um, but I, I've, I feel it's so, you know, one of the, the mantras I put out there, Jenna, now is that suburbia was the great lie and the knowledge of the ancients is where it's at. And certainly, you know, you can pick apart the ancients, but, you know, I feel like they were more dialed into the vibrations of the universe, the vibrations of human scope uh, from love and you know, creativity and just passionate about defining that in as many artistic, scientific, creative ways as they could. And I feel like that's the real mission for us. That's why we were put here. It wasn't to be a part of the age of consumerism, even though we're all stuck into it. 
but I feel like that's not the purpose. I feel like that's the anti-purpose. And really, it's it's just about family, love, friendship, taking good care, and then finding out what the next chapter is when you do close your eyes in this world and what purpose, let's say, the creator uh, has for you beyond that moment, which I think was a part of what I had to learn with my father's passing too. I mean, I I was very honored that my mother and my brother and other family allowed me to, to not do the eulogy, but say a few words uh, about my father, who is the man that adopted me along with my mother. But I've always felt that there was no greater act for a stranger to adopt another you know, family's child and raise that child lovingly as their own. I mean, I, you know, my father will always be my hero for that as well as my mother. But, you know, I, I told the congregation, beautiful congregation at the Methodist church, where, I'm, where my mother still plays the organ, I might add, <laughs> that, uh, that um, we all had to wish my father well in the next role he was being selected for, that he had gone back to the original child of God source moment and had a new, was probably being given a new mission, a new purpose in a different form. And that's a strange thing to think of because we'd all known him as, you know, Jim Scott, my father, my dad, the teacher that, you know, taught for 35 years at the high school and, you know, played golf and uh, bridge and, you know, all the stuff. I mean, that's the dad or the Jim Scott that we all knew. But now as a, a township, a family of Jim Scott, friends of Jim Scott, uh, we had to wish him well and almost let him go because that's a, that's a new form. That's a new person, a, a new entity, a new energy with a new mission. And, um, you know, that's strange to almost disassociate in a way. But I think that's the thing. You have to be able to not fear death. You have to know or when people do pass away in your lives that you have to wish them well in their next mission and that there will be some kind of reunion that is probably beyond our conception at a certain level, but we will know the people we love again and again and again. And so uh, that's why I think we should work hard to, uh, in this life, you know, work on those relationships, make those our jobs, make those our important things. And, you know, all the other stuff is just material, as they say, and in a way, um, immaterial. So I guess that would be my message. Thank you, Shannon. This has yeah. been such a wonderful conversation. I wish I was just down the road. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, Jenna. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's so you feel very uh, not down the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you feel very familiar to me, even though I can't see you right now. <laughs> yes, there's just my my Dr. Buzzard uh, moniker there. That's awesome. Um, but you know, next time you're you're here, of course, I would love to tour you around. Uh, if you come down this way, um, I mean, really, Rose Hill Cemetery is just two hours up the road. I'm I'm happy to. Uh, help you find your way up there and show you around the Rose Hill that I know. Um, yeah, there's a lot we could do next time you're in town. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you for continuing to share the stories of those who have died, for those that wish to listen and honor them. It's it's such a, a wonderful and unique experience that you've had as, as your life and that you've added to so many other people's lives. So thank you so much for that. Well, Jenna, I think uh, your podcast is, is a great... Um, strike out stab in the world if you will like you're staking out in the world i think we're we're all dying is a is a perfect name for it uh so i think you're really on to something and I, I i feel that your energy will be a part of its continued evolution and success so i'm just glad to be a part of that and and do hope that it was positive thank you shannon i wish you all the best and hope to be in touch again soon brilliant I hope something in today's conversation caused a moment of pause for you, something to reflect on, an instigator of a conversation with those that you love. We are all dying, and my hope is that in that reminder, we have the important conversations while we still have the chance.